Good morning, everybody. Uh, Mark is going to continue with his second talk today on general generalized Keller, Keller structures. Uh, thank you for agreeing to work so hard. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you again to the organizers for um, organizing this thing. I, I, I'm really enjoying the, uh, the talks. It's, uh, the speakers are really doing a good job. Yeah. Even though we're, people are in quite different areas, and so sometimes it's a bit impressionistic for me to listen, but it's amazing. I, I love it. In interaction. We are in interaction. Yeah, interaction. No, <laughs> actually, it's, it's actually successful so far. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to speak about some uh, work in progress with Yutsang Jiang, which um, if you, uh, if we all make it to the end of July, you will hear a kind of complete version of this at the Poisson Conference. Um, uh, as long as I and Yutsang don't melt down in the meantime. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, and, and, and so I, I apologize in advance that th this talk will uh, not be uh, extremely detailed because there's some details that are missing, uh, but the main part of it is now clear for the first time uh, about, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll, let, let me explain. So it's, it's really about um, this picture that I started describing about how a, a Kähler metric can be viewed as a Lagrangian submanifold in this larger space, um, this generalizes to the case of the symplectic type, and I explained that, and that's what um, that's what Leonard and Francis are using in their talks. But uh, symplectic type is just one half of the story, and then we need the general story. And so the question is, what is the story in general? And that's what I'll try to explain today. So. Um, so let, let's let's go back to what is a generalized Kähler structure. The definition of a generalized Kähler structure is very simple. We have uh, a manifold. We have its t plus t star. That's what I mean by this bold t t plus t star with a three form H, and we have a pair, and it's an ordered pair, J A and J B. Generalized complex structures which commute and which have the property that when you combine them together, we get a positive definite metric on T plus T star. Okay, and um, let me just put here that symplectic type it means that J A. Actually, I'm gonna just because it's let me put it on the next board because I, I should see a couple of words. So symplectic type. Um, means that J A looks like a symplectic structure. It doesn't necessarily have to be the exact form of a symplectic structure, but it has to be equivalent to that symplectic structure via a B field gauge transformation. The B field transformation looks like this. It's a closed two form. B is H, right? Yeah, you, you could, you, you, that's right. You could, um, that's right. Yeah, thank you. So, so the symplectic type case is. Uh, is a special case 
where one of the two GC structures is symplectic. A symplectic is the most generic type of GC structure. And so I'm, I'm assuming that one of the two, one of the members of the pair is, is generic and the other one is arbitrary. Okay, but they, they have to commute. And so it places implicit constraints on the whole structure. And, um, and this, this symplectic type case, it still has a lot of the interesting aspects of generalized Kähler geometry, because of course, one of these structures, JB, is completely general. It doesn't have to be a complex structure. But, but, it, uh, but, but it's definitely not um, you know, the, the general case. And so we need to describe the general case. So how do we analyze this? So a quick method of analysis. So a quick overview, quick review of um, the analysis of a GK structure in general. So in terms of what, what, does it, what does it imply to have this kind of structure on, on a manifold, let me just quickly review what, what you do. So, um, so because they commute, this is the, the most important aspect. Well, this, this is an endomorphism which has plus and minus i eigenspaces, and so is this one. And the, the fact that they commute means that the eigenspaces of JA decompose into the eigenspaces of JB. So that means that there's two possible joint I spectrum. The joint spectrum is either I, I, I minus I, minus I, I, and minus I, minus I. There's four different possibilities. So um, the, commute, the commuting complex structures implies that Tm is a decomposition of four spaces, L plus, L minus, L minus bar, and L plus bar. So it's a sum of four spaces. Uh, I'm sorry, I need more space. It implies that the generalized tangent bundle decomposes L plus, L minus, L plus bar, and L minus bar. Okay, where this is the so this is the um, this is the JA axis. This is I minus I, and this is the JB axis. This is I and minus I. Okay, I hope that's clear. This is the I I eigenspace for both operators, and this. I'll draw, I'll draw it here on an edge. Oops. This sum is called LA, the plus I eigenspace of JA. The sum of these two is the plus I eigenspace of JA. And this is LB, the plus I eigenspace of LB. And then of course this, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I should call this one LA bar. And this one um, is this is LB and LB bar, the complex conjugate. Uh, okay, and so um, the sum, the sum of these two form a Dirac structure. This is the complex conjugate Dirac structure. So the LA. What is in the interface is an intersection or what? Sum, it's a sum. It's a sum. Uh, I just mean that LA and LB, LA plus I eigenspace, LB is the plus I eigenspace. LB. Okay. So these are complex Dirac structures. Uh, these are maximal isotropic subspaces of T plus T star complexified. This is the complexification of T plus T star. And so we get a decomposition into what you could call half Dirac structures. These are, these small ones here are half the size of a Dirac structure. I should say that the positive definiteness, the positive, the positive definiteness condition, this condition here, 
implies that um, L that V plus L plus plus L plus bar and V minus, which is L minus plus L minus bar, are positive, positive, are um, maximal plus minus definite faces. And it implies also that they all have the same dimension. The dimension of L plus minus uh, is all equal to um, N. <clears throat> this is the dimension over C. And, uh, and uh, we can say that um, the dimension of M over R is 2M. Uh, okay. And you could think also about the, you could think about the, um, the current algebra. Here's Tm, here's T star M. Here's V plus, the positive definite subspace, Friedrich explaining yesterday. And here's the negative definite ortho complement of V plus. This is the generalized metric. This is the graph of G plus B. This is the graph of minus G plus B. And the point is that V plus, when you complexify it, splits into two spaces. V minus splits into two spaces. And these are L plus, L plus bar, L minus, and L minus bar. That's the picture of, uh, so this is just linear algebra. I teach linear algebra all the time, every year. I teach linear algebra, and so it's very useful. For this. And the thing that uh, is important is that these half Dirac structures, these little ones, we can project them down to T. And what we get is a half dimensional subspace in T, right? This is positive definite here. So it intersects T star in zero, so it projects V plus projects isomorphically to T. V minus also. And so when you, when you push this structure down to T, T gets decomposed into complex conjugate subspaces, which are involutive. And so therefore you get two complex structures on T. So L plus and L plus bar, they project Pi of pi, the projection to the tangent bundle, they project to a space that we should call T10 of I plus and T01 of I plus. Okay, and then L minus and L minus bar defined a different complex structure. And so we get two, we get a pair of complex structures or orthogonal, G orthogonal complex structures, I plus minus on N. This is the usual analysis. And then uh, the fact that, the fact that this L plus is involutive, it places a, places a constraint on the K forms and so the involutivity of L plus Minus implies that if I if I define omega plus minus g i plus minus that these satisfy the conditions g c plus omega plus is equal to h. These are these are the this is the factor mission structure of Gates, Gates, Hull, and Rochek from 1984. Okay, so this, this is the, the basic story of the analysis of this geometry. In order to specialize to the Kähler case, you need, you basically need those, you need this picture to have an additional symmetry, which is a flipping symmetry. If the symmetry was 
if there was a symmetry of this picture, flipping it over, and we would be in the Kaler case. Now, uh, okay, now, um, okay, so, when you look at this picture, you know, if you stare at this picture long enough, everything becomes clear. The problem is it may be a very long time that you stare at it. But see, L, L, plus, L plus bar or L minus bar, what are they? They are the Dolbo T01, right? These are the anti-holomorphic vector fields for the complex structures. And so this forms a Lie algebraid, right? Which is a complex Lie algebraid that defines the complex structure. Things that are invariant in this direction are, by definition, the holomorphic things. Right? Whether it's a function, a bundle, whatever. If this Lie algebra acts on something, it means that if it acts you know, via a Lie representation, it means that that object is holomorphic with respect to I plus minus. That's what this means. The fact that L plus bar is injected into this Courant algebra means that the Courant algebra must be holomorphic. The fact that L minus bar is injected in here means that the Courant algebra must be holomorphic with respect to I minus. Okay, so just by inspecting this, you can see that there are things that are holomorphic. Okay, and uh, and and to make that more precise, L plus minus bar being injected into T plus T star implies that uh, T plus T star inherits holomorphic structure. Um, and to make sense of this, this, this implication, what we do is we, we use the Courant reduction procedure that I developed with Zhu and Henrik Eberstein. So there's a Courant reduction. So Friedrich mentioned it yesterday. So the idea is that uh, we start with Tm and one of these spaces, I'll do it for L plus, okay. And you think of this as an isotropic, it is an isotropic, right? And this has a corresponding co-isotropic. And so what do you do to reduce? You take co-isotropic modulo isotropic and you get symplectic, right? Uh, of course, this is a symmetric pairing. So I'm using the term a little bit loosely, but the reduction produces um, the following. You take L plus bar, um, complement mod L plus bar, okay? And this is, uh, has a non-degenerate non pairing, but it also has an action by L plus bar, by bracketing, because of the, uh, because of the current bracket. You just, because L, L plus bar is sitting inside E plus, we can let it act on E plus by current bracket on itself, the adjoint action. So the adjoint action acts on this, um, Okay, and you can take the adjoint L plus bar invariant sections of this, and those would be the holomorphic sections. And this defines a holomorphic Courant algebra. Okay, and you can do the same thing for L plus or L minus, same, same idea. So we get two holomorphic Courant algebra just by reduction of the same thing. This is a definition of last time, right? Yes, it's a reduction of, by this isotropic, yeah. So, um, uh, right, and, and because, because, the, because we're saying that this is holomorphic with respect to L plus bar or L minus bar, what that means is that it's holomorphic with respect to I plus or I minus. So what we have so far, what we have so far is that we have uh, complex manifolds with holomorphic Courant algebra. And they're exact with exact holomorphic current algebra. Because as we showed in our paper, when you reduce by an isotropic, you always get something exact. Okay. You could, of course, try to reduce by something non-isotropic. That's the part of the, our paper that no one likes to read. But it's a very important part of the paper. It's just not used in this case. Okay. So um, the complex manifolds with holomorphic current algebra is E plus minus over X plus minus. X plus minus is the notation I use for M equipped with I plus minus. Okay. Uh, 
pair of photomorphic point algebraids obtained from the same real current algebra. So just to be clear, the current algebra E plus is L minus plus L minus bar, right? <clears throat> well, that's the next step. That's the next step. Yes, yes, that's the next step. Yeah. So what Drew is observing is that if you take L plus, let's take a look at this. Let's say that we're going to do a reduction by this isotropic. Okay, so this is isotropic. We want to find the co-isotropic. So we need to find what pairs zero with L plus bar. Well, I can tell you that because B plus is positive definite, L plus pairs with L plus bar to be non-degenerate, okay? So L plus bar is the only subspace here that is not orthogonal to L plus. L plus is isotropic, so it's orthogonal to itself. It's also orthogonal to both of these. So the, the co-isotropic would be this. This is the co-isotropic. This here is L plus bar per. So when you take L plus bar perp and you mod out by L plus bar, what you'll be left with is these two things. So it decomposes, that's what I'm saying. That's this observation, right? So, so uh, actually, so furthermore, further structure, the Dirac structures L A with or without a bar and L B with or without a bar. These are four complex Dirac structures sitting in here. They're visible here. One, two, three, four, all the lines. Okay. These complex Dirac structures can also be reduced. So in order to reduce it, what you need to do is you need to pass pass to the symplectic reduction. It's like reducing a Lagrangian by symplectic reduction. You have to take the Lagrangian intersect with the coisotropic and push down to the reduction. So that means that, for example, this Dirac structure will intersect perp, L, L plus bar perp in this space. This Dirac structure intersects here. And then when you pass to the quotient, you're gonna get this factor. Similarly, this Dirac structure intersects this guy in here and then pass to the quotient to get this factor, right? And you can see that for example, this Dirac structure and this Dirac structure both reduce to the same thing. And this and this reduce to the same thing. So even though you start with four, you end up with only two. These Dirac structures reduce down to E plus minus to give splitting. Uh, I shouldn't call it a splitting. It's called, it has a name, it's called a managed triple. So we have that E plus is equal to A plus B plus. And E minus is A minus plus B minus. And these are over X plus and over X minus. Okay. Now uh, I need to maybe just quickly uh, define what this is. So A plus is gonna be uh, LA reduced and uh, B plus is gonna be LB. A plus is LA reduced. B plus is LB reduced. So if I do the plus reduction, that's drawn here in yellow, mod this red thing. Okay, so I, if I take LA, I'm gonna get L minus here. And if I uh, do, L, if I take LB and intersect it here, I'm gonna get L minus bar. But what, what these are, uh, a man and triple, I'm sorry, I should have said, a man and triple, what is it? It's just a pair of transverse Dirac structures. And these are holomorphic. This is a holomorphic man and triple. Holomorphic man and triple. 
So these are holomorphic. You can always tell when I do holomorphic things because I make it curly. Curly A, curly B, curly E. So. Okay, now, uh, right. Now, if you look at the minus side, um, if, you do the, if you do the minus reduction, which is here, right, then the, the, uh, the minus reduction would be this one. I'm gonna overload this diagram, but Okay, uh, I think, yeah, the chalk is really, it's, it's melting too. Okay, so the, uh, so if I take, for example, LA and intersect it with uh, LB, uh, sorry, if I take LA and I reduce it, then I'll, I'll get this factor and same thing with, um, so you see here, like if I take LA and reduce it, right, I'm gonna get L plus. And if I take LB and reduce it, I'm also going to get L plus. So in the B reduction, in the minus reduction, LA and LB don't, don't give different things. It, they give the same Dirac structure. So I, I need to actually take LB bar in order to get the other factor. So let, let me write this out. So A minus is LA reduced, just like before. But for B minus, and this is, this is kind of important, okay? You cannot take LB and reduce it. You have to take LB bar. And so this may seem like a, this is one of those things where it seems like an unimportant detail, but it's a, it turns out to be actually very important. This bar, this uh, complex conjugation. So, uh, right. Now, this is, this is pretty much all of the holomorphic structure that I'm aware of, which exists on a generalized scalar manifold. Okay? A man in pair, a man in triple on, uh, in a holomorphic quantile algebra over a complex manifold. And you see, whenever you have a man in pair, a triple, a man in triple like this, okay? You, what you have is a, a current algebra, which is split into two pieces, like this, let's say A and B, okay? And um, whenever you have a man in triple like this, the uh, kind of a, a maybe a surprising thing at first glance is that it defines automatically a Poisson structure because inside a current algebra, you always have T star, and you could take any element in T star and you could decompose it into its A and B component. And then once you've got the A component, you can project it down to T. So you get a map from T star to T. And that map is always a Poisson structure. This is uh, um, uh, explained in, in, uh, and discovered by, um, by Weinstein, Liu, and um, Xu in uh, this famous paper from the early 2000s. So, uh, you know, some people, believe, and they are correct, that anytime you have a Poisson structure, it really comes from a man and triple. Man and triples are like the original, like they, they are the, uh, they are the uh, producers of Poisson structures. Like when you have this, the reason I say they're red is because anytime you have a Poisson structure, you can just use T star. You can always use, if, whenever you have T plus T star. Marco, yeah. according to your diagram, shouldn't it be LA bar and LB without the bar? In the reduction, so you no, I have to define. Well, okay, I mean, I have to define this somehow. I, I mean, I yes. have to tell you what do I mean. No, but you already defined e minus, so this is already fixed. Yeah, and e minus, there, yeah, reduced by l minus bar. I'm, so I'm that's right, I'm, I'm reducing by l minus bar, right? Yes, so I l minus when I reduce by l minus bar, I'm going to get these two spaces that you, you take the quotient of which space by, by l minus bar. The, of, of the orthogonal complement, yeah, the orthogonal complement is an orange, oh, yes, yeah. When I reduce that by L minus bar, I'm going to get the sum of these two spaces. And th where do they come from? They come from these two direct structures, LA and LB bar. That's why. You could have used LA bar and, and, uh, and, and LA, but I'm, I'm just, it doesn't matter. I, I have to pick one to define the, uh, the structure. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so inside here, this, this gives rise 
to a Poisson structure, which is the Hitchin Poisson structure, Poisson. And this gives rise to a Poisson structure also. But I, I, I don't include it in the nice yellow circle because it's a derived quantity. It's, 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 it's obtained from the Manning triple, okay? These are not rules. Everything, everything here is holomorphic. So everything that is the outcome of it is holomorphic. If, you, if you're holomorphic, your children holomorphic. <laughs> yeah, these are the holomorphic Poisson structures of the holomorph of, of generalized scalar geometry discovered by Hitch. So one question: Is there any interaction between these holomorphic data plus minus? Okay, so. That is exactly the right question. It's like, the question is, out of this GK structure, where they were all unified, right? It's like the polarization of society. So they, they got, we, we polarized it, right? And they, we now reduced it in two different ways. The plus way and the minus way, we got two different complex holomorphic structures, right? These complex manifolds, right? Maybe in the ideal world, or uh, I mean, in a fantasy world, you would think, oh, maybe this is just holomorphically isomorphic to this. Okay, it's a natural expectation, but it's just not true. We could have, for example, this space being, uh, just as an example, this could be P1 cross P1, and this could be the second Hertzebrook surface, F2, okay? And these are not isomorphic as complex manifolds, but they are smoothly diffeomorphic. So they can exist, they can coexist on the same manifold, right? Like the left and the right, they exist in the same country, but they are not isomorphic, no? Yeah? So the question is, what is the relationship between these two things, okay? And um, so, well, okay, so uh, maybe, maybe uh, just to say a few more words about this structure to give you a feeling of what is going on. Let me draw a picture of the manifold. I'll, I'll draw a picture of X plus. So this is a complex manifold now, um, and it has this Manning triple. Now, this is an exact Courant algebra. So in terms of the geometry of the actual complex manifold, you don't really see anything because this Courant algebra is transitive or it's, um, it's an exact Courant algebra. So the image of the anchor map is the whole tangent bundle, so you don't see any foliation or anything. However, it has a decomposition into two Dirac structures, each of which is a Lie algebroid, and the anchor maps of those give you foliations on the manifold, singular foliations. And so what you have is leaves of a foliation, right? Which you could call the A foliation. Okay. And then you also have the leaves of B. Okay. And because they sum to the whole space, that means that if you look at the image in the tangent bundle, they sum to the whole tangent bundle. So these two foliations are transverse, everywhere transverse. It doesn't mean that they're, they're complementary, but they're transverse. They sum to the whole space, okay? And if you look at their intersection, yeah, okay. if, I'm just increasing the number of pieces. <laughs> no. it's, like, it's like Christ with the loaves. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so then you have the intersection, right? The intersection of these two singular foliations is another singular foliation, and that's the one from the Poisson structure. So these are the symplectic leaves. Of sigma. Okay. This is the picture of a generalized cater manifold on one side. Okay, and if you move to the other side of the house, it looks exactly the same. It looks exactly the same. The, the foliations are the same. Everything is the same, but the holomorphic structure is different. So the complex structure on these leaves and on these leaves and on this space are different, but the actual ge geometric configuration is exactly the same. They're isomorphic smoothly, but not, uh, not, uh, not complex, okay? Right, so, okay. So the symplectic case, symplectic type, what does it mean? It means that, uh, remember, it means that JA is equivalent to a symplectic form, which means that LA, okay, LA, the plus I eigenbundle would be the graph of I omega inside T plus T star complexified, 
And therefore, LA would be a transitively algebra. It would map subjectively to the tangent bundle. So LA maps surjectively to the tangent bundle. And what that means is that this A, which comes from LA, LA gives rise to A. A is just the curly version of LA, okay, by reduction. It means that this foliation is the entire space. So in other words, it means that A is the whole space. It's full. It's a full, it's, it's not an interesting foliation, okay? This is the reason why this symplectic type case is simpler uh, it's because I, we, you know, by, by looking at the symplectic case, you are eliminating one of the two foliations. And as a result of that, what it means is that you only have one foliation left. Okay? You only have B, and the symplectic leaf foliation is the same as B. So instead of having three different foliations, you have only one foliation. That's why it's, it's much, much simpler. Okay. Okay. Um, so sigma is the imaginary part of sigma plus minus, right? Or the real part? Of it. Sigma? Yeah. No, uh, yeah. I understand why you're asking that question because in your paper you like to let sigma be real, but here it's holomorphic. I use I use the Greek letters for holomorphic. Sorry. It's holomorphic. It's the holomorphic Poisson structure. Yeah, but I mean, what is the difference between sigma and sigma plus minus? It's just because I'm on the plus side, so everything should have a plus. Okay. Plus, plus, plus. Yeah, but the same looks, it, it's really, it looks the same. But yeah. I guess the question is like, if it's sigma plus a foundation on T10 plus, or is it a, a real foundation on the underlying real manifold? Well, okay, but you see, like, once we do reduction, we're in complex geometry. Right. So you there's no, you, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do real and imaginary parts anymore. It's a holomorphic stuff, so it's, it induces foliations, holomorphic foliations, and all that. Okay. If you wanted to, what you could do is you could, you could apply the real part to everything or the imaginary part to everything, but the, 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 the geometry of the foliations would be the same. You just would lose the complex structure on them, but, the, but they would still be the, the same. So this Dirac structure and this Dirac structure and this Poisson structure, they have real and imaginary parts. Okay, I, I don't want to, that, that's a very interesting aspect, but I don't want to get, go into that. I, think that. I don't want to go into that. Okay, so, um, right. So now let me see what I'm supposed to say next. Okay, so, um, so in, in the symplectic type case, um, the, the, the relation between uh, the plus side and the minus side, is that we have what's called a holomorphic symplectic Morita equivalence. So, um, uh, I'm just running into I'm running into a, a little uh, notation problem, but uh, but it's okay. So. Um, uh, just for, um, oh, I, I wish that I had switched A and B, but it's okay. So the point is that if A, if A is not there, right, then the B foliation is the thing that you need to analyze. The B structure is what you need to analyze. And B is really the same thing as the Poisson structure, okay? And th therefore, what you're really trying to compare are just two holomorphic Poisson manifolds. So in the symplectic type case, what happens is that both sides um, are essentially just Poisson's polymorphic Poisson structures. And the relation between them is exactly that of holomorphic symplectic Morita equivalence. And this was the result that I had with, um, with uh, Francis and Maxime. So the picture is that, um, you see, like, we needed to interpret the meaning of the fact that both of these holomorphic structures came from the same origin. And so what we did was we just traced through, like, the fact that they both were reduced from the same structure. What does it imply about the resulting two holomorphic structures? And we found that actually 
between x plus sigma plus and x minus sigma minus. Okay. Um, so this is this is a Poisson holomorphic Poisson manifold, and I don't need to worry about the Mannin triple because uh, remember that. Um, uh, well, we saw uh, before I wrote that db was equal to h, right? So that means that the three form was trivial. So the gerb is trivial, the holomorphic current algebra is trivial. And so we don't have any holomorphic current algebra structure left. And we also don't have a anymore. We only have sigma. I keep repeating myself, but hopefully it's now clear that the only structure that I have remaining is the holomorphic Poisson structure. And we know from the work of you know, the whole Poisson geometry community and Alan Weinstein's whole program and so on, that this become this has an integration with, which is called the symplectic group, G minus omega minus. And I described that in my first talk. So we have a holomorphic symplectic manifold of twice the dimension living over here, which parametrizes all of the possible Hamiltonian flows of the base. And the nice thing is that this thing is symplectic and so it's a resolution of the Poisson structure. Similarly here, we have, um, we have this. Okay. And the idea that we showed was, the, the, the idea was that we actually have another holomorphic symplectic manifold that maps to both of these via Poisson maps. Okay. And so that means that although these Poisson manifolds are not isomorphic, these symplectic groupoids are equivalent. We have an equivalence of holomorphic symplectic groupoids. Okay. And the isomorphism class of this entire diagram is the generalized Kähler class. Okay, and the generalized Kähler metric, this is something I explained before, is an LS bisection in Z. So we have this possibility of many, many smooth C infinity bisections, sections of both of these maps. And each one of these bisections, right, it does a great job for you because what it does, if you have a section like this, if I just draw the picture here, sorry, I draw the picture, right, then having a bisection like this, right? having this C infinity bisection does a great job for you because what it does is that any point in X plus, you can go up, it will hit this thing at a unique point and then you can go down and it defines a diffeomorphism from X plus to X minus, putting the two complex manifolds back together again, like Humpty Dumpty. I don't know if there's a Spanish version of Humpty Dumpty. And so, you, so, so this, this degree of freedom, which is a Lagrangian submanifold, can, can vary. And when that varies, you are varying the GK metric in the GK class. The problem now is that, uh, so now what we're gonna do is go to the general case. Okay, let me just, yeah, okay, good. So in the general case, I really have to deal not with the Poisson structures. I can ignore the Poisson structures now because the Poisson structures are a derived quantity. And what I really need to deal with is A plus, B plus, A minus, and B minus, okay? I say general case means you're not symplectic type anymore? No, no longer symplectic type. Now I'm just back to the original problem. Okay. So do you still assume that H is uh, exact? No, no. The only reason that H was exact was because one of the GC structures was symplectic and therefore I killed, it killed H, okay? But if both are not symplectic, then there's no reason for H to be killed. So this is, we now go to the general case. And in the general case, you have these other famous examples. For example, the compact semi-simple even dimensional Lie groups. Like for example, you know, SU3 with the bi-invariant metric, the left invariant and right invariant complex structures. This is a famous example of a GK structure of general type. Okay, neither one could possibly be symplectic. The three form is not zero. Oh, I should have written the three form is the Cartan three form. 
Okay, so the question is, how do we analyze these GK structures? Okay, where where where, um, where we cannot reduce it to a Poisson problem. There's no reduction to Poisson problem. But luckily, people in the Poisson geometry community are very open-minded, and they considered not just Poisson geometry, but man and triples. They they developed that whole theory, and so now um, we're going to use it. Okay, so I have exactly enough time to just explain what the result is. I'm sorry, but I just need to explain the result and uh, it will look like the uh, ravings of a lunatic. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but uh, let me just write it. So, so to solve this problem, so this is the problem that uh, Yutsang Jiang, my PhD student has been working on for the past few years. And so he really had to learn a lot about the, um, about uh, this problem. So man in triples, the problem of man in triples. So man in triples are the same thing as what are called Lie bialgebroids. And so uh, this is just because we have two Lie algebroids, A and B, right? We have two Lie algebroids, A and B are Lie algebroids. They're Dirac structures, but they're Lie algebroids in particular, which means they have you know, brackets on their sections and they behave like a tangent bundle. So these are Lie algebroids, but they are in duality because you can use the pairing on the holomorphic current algebroid to identify, this is, this is maximal isotropic. So this is the dual of this. So, so this means that uh, B is isomorphic canonically with A dual, okay? And so what this means is that when you take, when you take the, the Duran complex of the Lie algebroid A, which is just the exterior algebra of the section, you know, sections of the exterior algebra of A dual, right? So this is sections of A dual, wedge, wedge of A dual, just like the Duran complex. And this will have a differential DA, just like the Duran complex. But now A dual is identified with B. And so B has a bracket. And this bracket gets inherited by the Duran complex. And so we get a bracket coming from B. And this becomes a differential graded Lie algebra. Okay. So whenever, whenever you have a Lie algebroid structure on the dual of a Lie algebroid, which is compatible with the differential, we call that a Lie bi algebroid. And I'm sorry, but I, I, I mean, I should cite uh, a whole bunch of people who developed this. And um, you could look at Liu Weinstein Shu again, or you could look at, uh, um, yeah, I, I'm leaving out a whole bunch of references, but hopefully, yeah, that's for, if I actually, Thanks to all the people that needed to be thanked, I would, I would, I wouldn't finish. So here you are, either on the plus or the minus, right? So your B's and A's are. I mean, yeah, that's right. So both. So this structure of Lie algebra it exists on both sides. Okay. And part of the uh, understanding that the community had about these Lie algebra is that they they have the following structure. So Suppose that we have, so integration of Lie by algebras. And um, I'm just gonna put not me here, okay? So it's a lot, large number of people over many years, okay, they understood the following, that, that if X has a Lie by algebra structure, A and B, which sum to a current algebra, so that we have a Lie by algebraid structure, then we have two Lie algebraids to integrate, the Lie algebraid A and the Lie algebraid B, and the Lie algebraid A will integrate to a groupoid. This is the groupoid integrating the Lie algebraid A, and this is the groupoid integrating the Lie algebraid B. Okay, now when you, you know, when you have a bunch of algebraids, you can pick one, integrate it, and then see what structure the other algebroids induce on that integration. So in other words, what I could do is literally pull back B to GA 
and then it will give a geometric structure on GA. So here, originally, I had two geometric structures, A and B. I integrated one, which makes that geometric structure into just the multiplication on this groupoid. So I'm, I've lost the geometric structure. But this other geometric structure, it passes to GA. And what does it become? It becomes a Poisson structure. I'll call it pi B, because it comes from B. Okay. Actually, um, this is ex extremely well explained in the paper of Alexei of Verstein and, and Meinrenken. They show that GA mapping to X cross X is a strong forward Dirac map. B is transverse to the uh, to A, and therefore it can be pulled back. And when you pull it back, it's guaranteed to be transverse to the to the tangent bundle, and therefore it's a Poisson structure. So there's a very beautiful argument why B passes to pi B. Okay. And the problem is it's not even due to them, but they, they explained it ex very nicely, but it was, you know, it's a sequence of large number of contributions. And, and this guy also receives a Poisson structure and these become Poisson groupoids. So, uh, right. Now, the thing is that now what we have is, is a space which has a dual behavior. It has a groupoid structure, but it also is a Poisson manifold, okay? And because it's a Poisson manifold, you could ask about whether it can have, it, whether it can be integrated to a symplectic groupoid. And so this will have a symplectic groupoid above it, okay? It's gonna be uh, something that I'll call D, and it has a symplectic form. This is a symplectic, And it's a groupoid over G A pi B. And, and now this thing, right? Um, well, the amazing thing, and maybe it's not so surprising because they, uh, they both have the same origin, is that when you do the symplectic groupoid of G B, you get exactly the same thing. And what we end up with is a groupoid of groupoids, a groupoid in groupoids in two different ways. It's like a rhyme, uh, like a children's rhyme or something, right? And it's called the symplectic double groupoid. If you wish, um, if you're if you're one of these simplicial people, a simplicial maximalist, what you can do is just sum over the diagonals, and you'll see that you have level zero, level one, and level two. So it's a it's a two-step simplicial manifold, right? And it is a two-shifted symplectic structure. So this is a two-shifted symplectic structure. And the reason that I am telling you this is um, because I know that because it's such a you know, trendy topic, these shifted things, that means that when I write this down, there will be some eyebrows that go up. And the eyebrows did go up, I can tell you, because I looked at you. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this is one shifted um, symplectic structure. It's also groupoid and, and so on. So there, there's some kind of you know, categorical level that is increasing, obviously. But, um, but anyway, these are double groupoids. Okay, so um, so that means that that means that on one side, right? On one side, on the x plus side, I will have one of these. And in the symplectic type case, what happens is that this one is already symplectic. And this is just the, the product of this with itself. It's just the pair groupoid of this. So this is kind of derived from this. And this, this is similarly derived from, from this. So this collapses in a way. It becomes a trivial version of a double groupoid in the symplectic type case. Okay. So, so, so on both sides, on x plus minus, we have double symplectic groupoids. I maintain, a, I, I really enjoy talking with, with uh, Rochek about things, and I haven't talked to him about this step yet, and I, I'm afraid of his reaction when I start telling him about double groupoids. <laughs> It's a little bit, a little bit much, a little bit difficult to take sometimes. 
But anyway, we have two double symplectic group points, and the question is, how are they related? What is the relation between d plus and d minus? And to answer this question, I'm going to make use. I'm going to use a, a beautiful series of papers by Pavel Chevera. of um, moduli spaces um, of <clears throat> um, connections or moduli, yeah, it's, it's his theory, the melting is starting now. So it's Severa's theory of moduli spaces on uh, Riemann surfaces, two-dimensional surfaces with boundary and corners. And, um, and uh, the problem is that I need to use it in a holomorphic version. Okay, because he developed everything that he did in the real version. And in fact, one way to understand the construction of this D is the moduli space of, so um, I'm gonna draw a diagram where um, you, you have to imagine that you have uh, a square uh, literally uh, an interval across an interval, and you have the um, you have maps into uh, X, where what you do is this: you 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 decorate the boundary, the components of the boundary, with Dirac structures. So you put, for example, here you put A and A, and you put B and B. So what does this mean? So it's, it's the module, let me just put a uh, moduli space of maps like this, okay? And let me, I don't have time to make it precise, but the idea is that you should consider maps of this surface into X such that at the boundary, there's a boundary condition that the Lie algebraic morphism from the tangent shifted by one of this surface into the Corant algebraic should land in A or in B, right? This, this path should land in B, and therefore this will be a B path, and therefore it will be a point in the groupoid integrating B. So this will be, this will be a path or an element in GB, and this will be an element in GA, and this whole thing, this whole thing, this whole square is a double arrow, right? Um, and so you can see, for example, like the map from here to here, there's two maps, source and target, which gives you two A paths. So given one of these squares, I can restrict to the boundary and I get the first point, the source A path and the target A path. Or I could map it the other way and look at the source B path and the target B path, okay? And, and, and so the beautiful thing about this is that you can just draw diagrams, just draw a diagram, and then you get a symplectic moduli space, symplectic. Since A intersect B, is zero. So this implies this. It's because when you when you go to the corner, you need that the intersection is, is trivial there. That's what happens. Okay, so I have just enough time now to explain what we do. You mentioned something about the holomorphic nature now. Is, is there any variation in this? Yes, um, that's what I'll describe now. Okay. So, okay. so what you need to do uh, is the following. So the answer, this is, this is a you know, partial, partial result so far with Jian. Partial result. And this is the following. So uh, I don't know if you, ever played the game tic-tac-toe as a child. But that's what we need to do. Okay. These, okay, so now what I'm gonna say is, I'll explain where these things have to live. So remember that we had L plus, L minus, L plus, uh, sorry, L minus bar and L plus bar. This was our decomposition of the current algebraid. 
into four half Dirac structures, which are actually in complex conjugate pairs. Complex conjugation is the reflection through the origin. This is complex conjugation. Okay. Reflection through the origin is complex conjugation, and here's the origin, and this picture is supposed to be of the same nature. So here, let's look at this. So the, here, what I want is I'm, um, <clears throat> so this is going to be the double groupoid integrating, uh, oh yeah, so this was LA, and this was LB. So I need to use the following. I'm, I'm going to do um, L, L, A, and L, B. L, B, and L, A. So this means that I'm going to look at a moduli space of maps from the square such that this boundary is in L, B, and this one is in L, B, this is in L, A, and this is in L, A. Now, because these are the same, as each other, and these are the same as each other, that means that I can take another square of this, another map of the square of this type, and I can, I can, I can compose them this way, and I'll still get something of the same type, or I could compose them this way, and I would still get something of the same type that has, you know, LB, LB, LA, and LA. Same thing here, LA, LA, LB, and LB. So this means this thing is a double group one. You can compose horizontally and vertically. So this we call D uh, plus plus, D, D plus. This is the double groupoid. Okay, now what's the problem? The problem is that look at what happens at the intersection of LA and LB. LA and LB do not intersect in zero as Chigurh requests. They intersect in L plus. Hmm. I, I wish, yeah. Yeah, I'm, again, there's a, there's a slight, there's a complex conjugation problem, but this vertex has an L plus. And this vertex also has an L plus, and this vertex has an L plus and an L plus. So what it means is that in order to do Chavera's construction, what you need to do is consider the moduli space of maps, but you need to mod out by an additional group of symmetries, which you didn't have to do in the first case. You need to look at, actually, I, I wish that I had chosen, let me just con complex conjugate the picture, I'm sorry. It's just the technicality of how I drew the diagram. So this means that I need to take L plus bar invariance on this moduli space, and therefore I need to do a reduction, right? So when you uh, form the moduli space with these, where these corners are associated to half Dirac structures, what happens is that you get a holomorphic structure on X plus. So this becomes the holomorphic double groupoid on the plus side. Okay, and, um, and here you get the holomorphic double groupoid on the minus side. Here you get the complex conjugate of this, and here you get the complex conjugate of that. Okay. And then for here, right, then what happens here is that I do not use LA and, and uh, <clears throat> I do not use LA and LA. Here, what I use is some, sorry, I should not oh, I have it all written here, good. So let me just draw the diagram properly. Uh, okay, wait. It will only take me a minute. LB, LB, LB bar, LA, LA, LB bar, and uh, LB, LB bar. These are going to be all different now LA and LA bar. And here we have LA bar. LB bar, LB, and LB bar. And here we have um, LB, all bars, LB bar, LA bar, LB bar, LA, LA bar, and so on. So um, you, based on this diagram, right, you can produce nine symplectic manifolds. 
nine symplectic manifolds. So we get from here nine symplectic manifolds, holomorphic symplectic manifolds, and they form. And I'm just going to draw one more picture and I'll be done. Sorry. I've never spoken about this yet, so that's why I'm kind of excited. I want to show the, the result. So we have a double group point of So here's one of those symplectic uh, manifolds. It's a double groupoid. Now, there is a Morita equivalence between X plus and X minus, but this is a Morita equivalence between A plus and A minus. These are the groupoids, I'm sorry. This is the groupoid of A plus. This is a, a picture, a diagram of integrations. Okay. And this has a double group weight here as well. D minus, D minus. This, this is a Poisson groupoid. It's uh, from the theory. This is a Poisson groupoid. This is a Poisson groupoid, and this is a Poisson Morita equivalence between those groupoids. This Poisson manifold has a symplectic groupoid. But this symplectic groupoid, right, it's built from here in this square. And so it actually has four boundary components. These are two of the four boundary components, and these are the other two. So this is this, this is the next symplectic manifold. This is the other symplectic manifold. And similarly, we have the complex conjugate of this diagram. We have x minus bar and x plus bar, right? And here we have uh, a space, let me just call it W. This is a symplectic Morita equivalence between B plus, and this is the thing that confused us for the very longest time, is that it's a symplectic, it's a Poisson Morita equivalence between B plus and B minus bar. Let me draw it here, B minus bar. Okay, and this comes from that funny bar that occurred in the reduction thing, that A and B were treated in a slightly different way. X plus, you know, A plus and A minus are Morita equivalent, but B plus and B minus are not Morita equivalent. B plus and B minus bar are Morita equivalent by a Poisson uh, Morita equivalence, which has an integration G of W, which is also mapping there. And here's another symplectic manifold. And so we continue with the complex conjugation with this. Um, uh, here's um, a minus bar, E minus bar, this, and similarly here, we have a um, complex conjugate of this, A plus bar, bar, here's the other, and finally we have D plus bar, minus bar, that's a D plus bar. Okay, and then finally, we have one more because I've only drawn eight of these. Okay. Sorry, there's another, there's a complex conjugate W bar here and another one down there. But we have the middle guy, which, which, is, which cannot be composed. In, it has no compositions whatsoever, but it's a double Morita equivalence, a double Morita equivalence, which is right here. Uh, that I may see. And it maps here, 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 and here. So we have nine uh, symplectic manifolds. So all this entire diagram is holomorphic. And the final part of the theorem, which is not yet complete, is to identify where is the metric. The metric is a um, brain bisection in all of, of these Poisson spaces, which would which would integrate to a Lagrangian subgroupoid of the circled spaces. It's a Lagrangian subgroupoid of this entire thing, which is invariant under con complex conjugation. Okay, so um, thank you for your attention.
You want me to make it simple, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just natural. <laughs> Do we have questions? Yes. So, what, what do you use or how do you use this Severa Syrian? What are the 2D surfaces? Or this is just something that you take inspirationally or you actually are using? Well, okay, so what Severa is doing is he's using like Trent Simon's theory basically in order to produce symplectic manifolds, symplectic modular spaces. The problem is that with Trent Simon's theory, like the usual theory is that if you have a a Tia bot, right? A Tia bot told us that if you have a compact room and surface, you get a symplectic modular space, a flat connection. But if the surface has boundary, you get Poisson. But if you put a boundary condition, you get symplectic again. So if the boundary condition is Lagrangian, it's almost like there was no boundary and you get a symplectic thing again, right? That was, you know, Alexei of Meinrankin, if you wish. Now, what Chevera did, what, his main observation is that you go down to a point. It's like a it's topological field theory that goes down to a point. If you have now the two boundary components that intersect in a point, if you put the right boundary conditions, which are Lagrangian and which intersect in zero, it's like you don't have a boundary or a corner and you get symplectic again. So that, that's the point is that um, anytime that you're trying to integrate an algebroid, a, a Poisson algebroid or a shifted symplectic structure, the way you're supposed to integrate it is by using Trent Simon's theory. That's what Chevere is telling us. Right? He's saying, if you want to get these symplectic groupoids, double groupoids, multi equivalences, whatever symplectic manifold you want to build, you build it as a moduli space for surfaces. Surfaces mapping into the Lie algebra. Infinitesimal data, you look at the moduli space, you get global data. That's his whole philosophy. Okay? And he just brought this to a level of sophistication, which is, you know, because he, he went down to a point. That's the point. You know, that's how he did it. So the only difference here uh, is, is, uh, is, is that you need to uh, extend it slightly to the case where the complex, where the Dirac structures are complex, okay. and there's not really there's not really any uh, kind of big huge obstacles to it. It's conceptually the same. It's just that you need to include you need to include this idea of doing reduction, uh, and you see like th the fact that I had to use these C infinity representatives of the holomorphic Dirac structures. That was essential because you need them all to be in the same space. All these things are being sent to, to the manifold, just with different boundary conditions and then modding out by different groups of symmetries. Um, does that answer yeah. your question? And these moduli spaces that you are building, is there a form of resemblance with, with this as said picture? Where you construct moduli spaces of brains? Oh, or not really. Uh, well, okay, I'm not, I, I don't know, but it seems to be a different thing, right? It's, it's Trent Simon's theory that produces these moduli spaces. Uh, it's, it's a different thing. However, when we, when we have to talk about the metric, the metric is a Lagrangian inside this, and then it's a brain. And then you have a moduli space of brains, and that's what, that, that's what Lenk was talking about. That because, the, the, because the GK metric is a brain, that means that it has the structure of, of mirror symmetry. S the space of brains is always complex, and so you get this Kähler manifold of, GK metrics, but but yeah, at this level, I don't think, uh, as far as I can tell, it's not really. Yeah. I have a maybe technical question that sometimes these constructions they, they have uh, smoothness problems. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Do you know in this particular I, case is there the something? Uh, uh, so because you're an expert in Poisson geometry, you know the truth, which is that <laughs> this. Uh, so the truth of the matter is. That when you talk about integration of Lie algebras, okay, it is not really understood at this point in time what the conditions on this Lie algebra are, which would guarantee the existence of this symplectic manifold, okay? Because it's a stack, it's a modular stack. Mm -hmm. So, so that means that people break their back <laughs> trying to prove exactly what the conditions are to make sure that this thing is smooth, mm -hmm. okay? But, but okay, you know, um, you know, these days. If you're if you're okay, you know I have to pretend that I'm okay with derived st higher stacks, and that's what it is. So it's a two shift symplectic right. higher stack. But there was in the you no, know, but to be honest, like, yeah, we, we just don't know. Like there are major unsolved problems about integration of Lie algebras, and I'm leaving that. You know. I know, but it, this is a, a special case. For example, in your in the first talk, yeah. the group point was just a semi-manifold T star. So there was something oh, very special. Well, well that, that was in the Kähler case and in the example that I picked. But in general, even in that, even in the symplectic case, the, the nature of that integration won't be just T star. Mm. It's just that in, in the very simplest cases where the Poisson structures are very simple, 
what, what Weinstein calls exponential type, yes. okay, then the groupoid is particularly simple as a space. But even in that case, there would be smoothness issues. Another question, yeah. if, if you care about small things, would you do oh. with local versions of this? Absolutely, yeah. And then, yeah. then all these, yeah, all these problems, problems go yeah. away. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Yeah. Those the are representatives, maybe, if the Lagrangian leaves close to the identities. Or yeah, yeah. You, what, you, what, what Alejandro is saying is that if you take these, these squares to be mapping into a very small neighborhood of Pont, if you, if you look at, it's almost perturbative, but you could make it slightly non-perturbative, making them go into very small regions with diameter very small, right? Then there's no problems of smoothness, and this picture exists perfectly. Actually, I'm not quite sure about that in the double in the yeah. a algebraic case. I, I don't yeah, actually know. It should. But, but at least in, in many cases similar to this, when you do local things, it, it works. But uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Any more comments or questions? Or burning desire to drink coffee? Uh, I guess we can thank Marco again. Okay, thank you.